today i have to speak on uh, imaging of rotator cuff what to report so it's basically a very uh, day to day topic for everyone so i tried i've tried to make it as simplified as possible everybody has different ways to look at the rotator cuff so mr basically provides exquisite details of all the cartilaginous elements ligaments tendons and muscles it provides information about marrow edema and bone contusions which no other modality can it's multiplanar no contrast is required it gives information about unossified cartilage as well neurovascular bundles and it's however expensive and not readily available so my protocol for rotator cuff tears is coronal sagittal and axial pdfs images i use the coronal t2 to identify a tear versus tendinosis a sag t1 i use basically for these muscles whether there is any fatty atrophy or uh, fatty replacement and axial i do not take a gradient image pdfs i feel is more than enough to see the articular cartilage and the labrum now optional images are gradient images 3d pd fat sat images which are uh, currently available on some machines which are good some vendors don't have a good 3d pdfs some have a good one so if you have if your machine is giving a good one that is a good idea to use because you can have multiple reformations to see a uh, uh, see small tears so basically uh, supraspinatus tendon is the most important one it has to be imaged very well the technicians have to be really well trained to be able to give good images of the shoulder so you have to understand that there is a supraspinatus muscle and a supraspinatus tendon this is the myotendinous junction which is giving rise to the tendon and that tendon inserts over the greater tuberosity so your angulation of these sections oblique coronal images of the shoulder have to be angulated parallel to this tendon and not the muscle and definitely not according to the anatomy like you don't have a straight sag or a straight coronal it has to be parallel to this tendon and perpendicular to that tendon the field of view has to be in such a way that the glenohumeral joint is in the center and you are covering adequate portion of the supra, uh, the rotator cuff muscle and also going just beyond the insertions of the tendons you shouldn't have a too large fov otherwise you will end up seeing the lung lung parenchyma and breathing artifacts these should not extend in the air so your fov has to be perfect around 15 to 16 cm fov the hand has to be placed in neutral position that is the thumb has to be pointing upwards and there should be a air gap between the arm and the chest if there is an air gap then there is no transmission of the breathing artifacts to the shoulder and you get better images without any movement artifacts one more thing that to remember is the first section has to go through the acromioclavicular joint if it does not go to the acromioclavicular joint you are going to miss or sacromial and its different types we are going from top to bottom this is the supraspinatus muscle and this is the tendon as you go down you start seeing the longed of biceps coming out then you start seeing the subscapularis and the infraspinatus tendons the infraspinatus tendon goes right up to this point and inserts over here does not insert here as it's most commonly thought the subscapularis goes to the lesser tuberosity does not go beyond the lesser tuberosity this is one more important thing to remember and this is the small tendon of the teres minor which is much lower down as compared to the infraspinatus tendon similarly when you are going from anterior to posterior these are the multipinnate appearance of the subscapularis tendon as it inserts over the lesser tuberosity then you have the longed of biceps crossing and then you start seeing the supraspinatus tendon so your longed of biceps is the landmark to tell you on the coronal images whether the subscapularis is finished and the supraspinatus has begun so this is the supraspinatus muscle and the supraspinatus tendon inserting over the greater tuberosity lastly as you go more behind you have the infraspinatus tendon on the top and the teres minor tendon at the bottom in the sagittal sections as you go from in the in to outside or from medial to lateral you start seeing the muscle belly and you start seeing a small tendon inside so this is the myotendinous junction of the supraspinatus the subscapularis infraspinatus and more lower down you start the teres minor so these tendons come together and form the sub subscapularis tendon this is the longed of biceps that is coming out so this is a rotator cuff interval this on on the top you are starting to see the supraspinatus tendon this is the infraspinatus and this is the teres minor so you should trace them right up to their insertions so as i said when you start seeing the longed of biceps tendon you have to know that 
the subscapillary tendon is already over so anything beyond that you, it is not going to be a subscapillaris it has to be supraspinatus so you see, see the entire insertion of supraspinatus from here to here this is what you call as the conjoint tendon where you really can't differentiate between the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus this is the infraspinatus and much lower down you see the teres minor this is a sagittal t1 weighted sequence which shows you a normal muscle belly appearance when you start seeing this bright fat within the muscle belly you start to identify what is called as a fatty replacement this is further graded as grade 1 2 3 and 4 as we'll see later on so next we start seeing what is called as the rotator cuff the first and the most important tendon that you evaluate is the supraspinatus so this is graded according to the different types of degeneration right up to the tail so what really starts is the degenerative signal which is called as a supraspinatus tendinosis this appears as a slight swelling of the supraspinatus tendon with bright signal on pd fat sat images you may or may not find inflammatory fluid in the subacromial bursa but definitely you start seeing a signal change now this signal change is because of a mild tendinosis this further progresses into moderate and severe tendinosis and later on when the tendon acquires a signal which is as bright as the joint fluid or the bursal fluid then you start calling it as a tear the earlier textbooks you may find the term tendinitis but nowadays we don't use the word tendinitis because there is no inflammation in the supraspinatus or any tendon basically so you start calling it as mild moderate and severe tendinosis and then followed by a tear this is an articular surface tear one more thing that you need to understand is this is the insertion or the footplate of the supraspinatus that is inserting over the greater tuberosity there is no articular cartilage over the greater tuberosity the articular cartilage starts in the humeral head and ends at the humeral head neck junction so this is the articular surface from here to here is the insertion and from the top is your bursal surface so this in the illustration that i am showing you is a partial thickness tear involving the articular surface so because of the partial thickness tear involving the articular surface and there is slight retraction of the tendon this is called as a pasta lesion or partial articular surface tendon avulsion so when you mean to say tendon avulsion means the tendon has come off and it has avulsed and traveled a little bit of distance from the insertion then you start calling it as a pasta tear so this is how you see it diagrammatically this is an example of a bursal surface tear now you are seeing that this is the articular cartilage this black line is your supraspinatus tendon articular surface this is the insertion but here you see that there is discontinuity of the bursal surface and this is a bursal surface tear whenever there is a bursal surface tear there is what is called as a puddle sign or fluid collection along the lateral aspect of the greater tuberosity going down there that is because there is a rupture of a wall of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and that fluid leaks into this space and forms what is called the puddle sign so whenever you have a suspicion of whether you should give a bursal surface tear or not identify this fluid if there is fluid you can definitely give it as a bursal surface tear the third variety is an interstitial tear now in this patient you see this black line which is an intact articular surface a black line on top which is the intact bursal surface and in the center this bright signal which is as bright as fluid is intrasubstance tear or interstitial tear this is how you see it in this sagittal image and this is a diagrammatic representation now there is something called as a rim rent or an insertional tear now insertional tears which can be full thickness or like this which can be small and partial thickness you need to identify sometimes by enlarging the image and seeing that there is a very very small tear there now, this is an insertional tear not involving the bursal or articular surface and there is no retraction so this is not pasta this is not any avulsed tear but there is a very very small focal tear at the insertion and that is what you call as a rim rent tear or a focal partial thickness insertional tear sometimes they may be complete sometimes they are partial then when you start seeing the tears whether they are partial or full thickness tears you start seeing or something called as retraction so whenever the retraction is less than 10 mm it is called as grade 1 retraction whenever it goes up to the mid humeral head or about 1.5 cm to 2.5 cm it becomes a grade 2 retraction when it goes up to the glenohumeral joint or more than 3.5 cm it becomes a grade 3 retraction you don't see a tendon at all when you are imaging the mid portion of the humeral head and sometimes when it goes beyond the glenohumeral joint it becomes a grade 4 
retraction. Next, we move on to what is fatty replacement. Fatty replacement is the replacement of the supraspinous fossa or any muscle belly by bright signal on T1 weighted images, which is called as fatty replacement. They are further graded into less than 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and more than 75 as grade 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now in this, you see that the teres minor muscle is completely replaced. So this is grade 4 fatty replacement. This is around grade 1 fatty replacement of supraspinatus. This is grade 2 fatty replacement of the infraspinatus. Then you move on to calcific tendinitis. Now here you can notice that there is itis. This is because there is inflammation because of deposition of calcification within the tendon substance or the calcification within the tendon substance has just extruded and gone out into the subacromial space, subacromial bursa and that is what is incited in inflammation or inflammatory response. That is when it is called as calcific tendinitis and it becomes painful. And when you start doing a lot of rotator cuff ultrasounds, you will find that there are calcifications in a lot of people, but all of them do not have tendinitis because all of them do not have symptomatic calcifications. So whenever the symptoms are there, there is tendinitis. You, because the rotator cuff tendons are susceptible to external impingement, you have to look for types of acromion. Type 1 is the flat undersurface, type 2 is concave or some undersurface which is parallel to the humeral head. Type 3 is type 2 morphology with an anterior inferiorly directed spur and type 4 is when the undersurface is convex. Then there is something called as a keel spur in which the spurring is seen on the lateral aspect as well as the medial aspect on the coronal images. This is what is called as a keel spur and keel spur is almost always associated with a tear of the underlying supraspinatus tendon. You have a down sloping acromion in which the horizontal uh, appearing bone is the clavicle and the acromion is gone down or it is down sloping and that is what reduces the space for the supraspinatus to move and that becomes a factor for external impingement. Acromioclavicle arthrosis itself because of presence of osteophytes and synovial hypertrophy can cause reduction in this space in the critical zone and thereby leading to a tear of the rotator cuff. Osacromial, if there is a formation of the pseudoarthrosis because of osacromial, then this fragment moves with every abduction and adduction and that gives rise to impingement or external impingement of the supraspinatus tendon. Similar to the supraspinatus tendon, you have partial thickness and complete or full thickness tears which are seen in the infraspinatus subscapularis and rest of the tendons. Whenever there is a tear of the tendon, you should measure the tendon tear from anterior to the posterior aspect and whenever there is a partial thickness tear, you have to measure the percentage of the thickness that is involved. That is whether the partial thickness involves 50% of the tendon thickness. 30% or more than 70% or whether it is near full thickness tear. In this patient, you are seeing that there is full thickness tear of the infraspinatus tendon with retraction of the tendon up to the glenohumeral joint. Next is subscapularis tears. Subscapularis tears, you have to remember that subscapularis tear, subscapularis inserts from in a vertical fashion from top to bottom along the lesser tuberosity. So you have tears involving the upper portion, mid portion and the entire subscapularis. This has been further classified by Lafos as type 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 tears. Type 1 is upper one third which is partial tear. Type 2 is upper one third which is a complete tear. Type 3 is upper two third. Type 4 is the entire supraspinatus subscapularis tendon but there is fatty infiltration of 1 to 3 and more than 3 is type 5. So these are the Lafos subscapularis tears. Now why you need to identify that is if the upper portion is involved then you are going to look for long head of biceps dislocation or subluxation. They usually are not involved in lower subscapularis tendon tears and second most important thing is there is different treatment for the different types. So this is an example of Lafos type 1 in which you have a tear which is partial thickness involving only the upper portion of the subscapularis. Type 2 when there is full thickness tear but only involving the upper portion. This is type 3 and this is type <clears throat> 3 but uh, it's almost upper two third and lower portion of this tendon is still intact. And type 4 in which there is complete or superior to inferior entire subscapularis tear is there in this patient and that's why the humerus has subluxed anteriorly. In the infraspinatus tendons the, sub the humeral head subluxates posteriorly.
Now, whenever you must have uh, seen terms that uh, people have described as massive rotator cuff tear. The massive rotator cuff tear is called when the tear is more than 5 centimeters in size and involves at least two muscles. So, it usually involves the combination of supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons and the tears are more than 5 centimeters in size. So, in this patient, you can see that subscap is intact, the teres minor is intact, but there is a tear of the supra as well as infraspinatus. So, this is what you call as a massive tear. And whenever there is complete tear of all the tendons around the humerus, except maybe the <coughs> teres minor tendon, the subscap, supra and infra, all of them are torn, then you call it as a global rotator cuff tear. Sometimes because of chronic complete tears of the supraspinatus, what happens is the humerus has shifted upwards or there is superior migration and that constantly irritates the acromioclavicular joint which undergoes a diastasis or dislocation and then the fluid in the subacromial bursa goes out and forms what is called as a subcutaneous swelling, cystic swelling. But you identify this subcutaneous swelling clinically but what is actually a problem is a full thickness complete tear which is a kind of a neglected tear and that is what is called as a geyser sign. So whenever you see a subcutaneous swelling overlying the acromioclavicular joint you should always look for a tear in the supraspinatus tendon. Adhesive capsulitis is almost always mistaken for rotator cuff tears that's why I just put one slide. Still seen adhesive capsulitis the findings are the anterior inferior joint capsule is thickened and bright and there is dirty looking soft tissue in the rotator cuff interval. If you find these two or either of these two, then you can give a diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. Lastly, let me conclude by take home points. What to report in a supraspinatus or basically a rotator cuff tear. First identify if there is a tear. If there is no tear, then you can call it as tendinosis and grade it as mild, moderate or severe. If there is a tear, try to identify whether it is an interstitial, partial thickness or full thickness tear. If it's a partial thickness tear, identify whether it is a bursal surface tear which is also called as antipasta, articular surface tear which is called as the pasta and insertional tear. And whenever there is a partial thickness tear, identify what thickness of the tendon it is involving. If it's a full thickness tear, then look out for retraction, measure the AP and transverse dimension of the tear. Identify any muscle bulk loss, identify the grade of fatty infiltration, look for tears of other cuff tendons, rotator cuff arthropathy if there, are, if there is any chronic change like interosseous cystic changes and I try to identify what caused the tear in the first place like types of acromion or any other factors of external impingement. Thank you very much for your kind attention.